everybody, welcome to Casey's Corner. Today's episode is about thyroid health, hormone health, functional medicine, all these buzzwords that I feel like are hitting mainstream very quickly, but for a really good reason, because they're things that people haven't talked about for decades. And my guest today is Whitney Crouch, who specializes in this kind of thyroid and hormone health. She's a registered dietitian, but her thoughts and her knowledge is so extensive. I can't wait to share this with you. So go ahead, check it out. Hi. Doing well. How are you? How are you? I mean, listen, I was excited when you reached out because not only do I have my own personal kind of medical history with thyroid stuff, um, but I, as I've been talking to more and more people, it is so common. I am seeing so many women struggle with thyroid issues. Uh, men too, actually. I'm hearing more men talking about the, the you know, underlying things that they probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have gone to the doctor for <laughs> in the past, that it turns out it's yes. from thyroid issues. So why don't you just take a second and share with so us I, what it is that um, I think you probably already introduced me. I'm Whitney Crouch. I'm an integrative registered dietitian. Um, most people probably think of weight loss when they think of registered dietitians, like meal plans. Um, food police is definitely one that we get. Um, <laughs> but that is definitely not what I do. Um, I, I look for the root cause of problems. I've had my own health struggles and journey, and that's where my passion grew. So I was trained conventionally. I worked in a hospital in Santa Monica for almost five years. I've taken many different career paths within my career, but I landed here as a functional medicine integrative dietitian after being di diagnosed with Hashimoto's after my first child was born. Um, and let me tell you, <laughs> it's not fun. It is not fun, and it's especially not fun for women who suffer for it long term and are underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, undertreated. Um, maybe diagnosed correctly, but given like horrible, horrible information about interventions that they can do and what's within their control, or even stuff that's outside of their control, what their options are. So I'm passionate about helping women to feel their best again and just live the life that they used to live and want to live and always saw for themselves but haven't been able to uh, regain since becoming ill. Mm. How is it, or what were the experiences that you, the symptoms that you started to experience, I should say, uh, when you were, you know, diagnosed with the Hashimoto's after mm -hmm. your, did you say, was your, after your first pregnancy? Yeah. So what was that like? And I'm just curious because I wonder how many people might be having yeah, similar symptoms so it's that's going very, it's, it's a very common condition, actually. One in eight women has hypothyroidism and almost like over 90% of the time, it's actually autoimmune Hashimoto's. If they have hyperthyroidism, then it's Graves' disease. Um, and so okay. there, you know, most people say, oh, I just have hypothyroidism, but I don't have Hashimoto's. It's not autoimmune. So there's nothing I can do. And I'm like, well, first of all, there's a ton you can do. Second of all, you may mm -hmm. just not have been diagnosed appropriately. You may not have been tested to know that you actually have the autoimmune disease. So symptoms of hypothyroidism, which can be Hashimoto's. So Hashimoto's is the underlying autoimmune. You cannot have symptoms of hypothyroidism mm -hmm. yet because you may not have enough destruction in your thyroid to be considered hypothyroid. But altogether, symptoms that we're looking at include brain fog, fatigue, uh, gut symptoms can come with it for one reason or another, you know, um, what came first, the chicken or the egg. And uh, dry skin mm -hmm. is very common. It can also come along with acne. There's often what's called periorbital puffiness. It's puffiness around the eyes. Um, water retention overall. Sometimes if there's a food sensitivity involved, there can be more puffiness and I'm not talking about like fat tissue with weight gain but that is also common um, but people can have like lower leg swelling it's called edema and it can all come hand in hand because there are thyroid receptors on every single cell in the body so if you don't have enough of this hormone reaching your cells you're going to see something wrong with essentially every body system yeah so. oh wow so it really, it's, yeah, it's such it a is, root absolutely. issue. I, mean, I personally, my symptoms, so 
anxiety, depression, postpartum depression can often be diagnosed when in fact it's a hypothyroid problem after pregnancy. 30% of women postpartum are uh, not diagnosed with a thyroid problem and they're diagnosed with depression instead, but that's the wrong diagnosis for them. Mm -hmm. So they're put on antidepressants, which is obviously oh, wow. not treating the root problem. So then their problems just get worse. Ugh, I can only imagine. And so there's, of course, so many schools of thought, right, around Western medicine and just the way that things are automatically here. Here's a prescription for something. But what is, I mean, I'm just thinking that number of one in eight is probably higher because there are so many people that just aren't getting diagnosed or aren't um, getting the treatment or, I don't know, everything that you said. I feel like there's some sort of, uh, you know, everyone goes to the doctor with something, mm -hmm. some combination of those things. And, you know, and I'm just thinking of my own experience. I did. And most recently, so my situation was I had a tumor on my thyroid about seven years ago. Um, and it was benign, but they wanted to remove the whole thing. So they actually had to take half mm -hmm. of my thyroid with it. Um, and my thyroid levels have been completely normal. I was on Synthroid for a little while uh, after the surgery. And then once I got pregnant, I was like, can I be off of it? And they checked my levels and everything. And they said, yes. But I haven't, I've never gone back on it. And it's just fascinating to me that my thyroid, which is only, there's only half of it, can still work to the capacity that it needs to without adding any sort of, you know, artificial hormone or hormone replacement like Synthroid. Do you think that there's a lot of like similar situations where we're kind of getting these medications where our body knows what to do on its own and don't really need the medication or in your experience kind of how do you see us kind of getting overloaded when our bodies might yeah, know so what to do on its there own? There are so so many factors when it comes to hypothyroidism and you know the reason for it like in your situation mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like you had any attack on your thyroid per se like obviously there was a benign tumor that was removed so maybe you had a really small mm -hmm. partial um thyroidectomy and you lucked out that your your thyroid mm -hmm. is robust enough to uh, make enough of the thyroid hormones to stabilize you some okay. people you know if they had a larger mm -hmm. resection wouldn't be in that situation so as for for those people you you are a special case there are definitely more people like you and i think that people should always mm -hmm. see what their capabilities are to let their body heal and be without um, a thyroid hormone replacement. So just to be clear, thyroid hormone replacement is not okay. your typical medication. It's just a hormone replacement. Right. Um, people that are really like medication averse, they tend to not want to be on it. And that's perfectly fine if you've done all the things and you try to get off of it and you, you methodically get off of it with the help of your doctor and test at the appropriate times. I'm all for that. Um, and medications technically you know, they, they do something to change pathways or they use certain metabolic, like biochemical pathways to upregulate or downregulate the systems in our body. So that's just, this is just a hormone that's replacing what was once there. Um, the problem with the hormones right. though, is that they do have excipients added that these are like uh, fillers. So different forms of the oh. medication. For example, if you look at levothyroxine versus Synthroid, we'll have different fillers. So levothyroxine mm -hmm. can have things that people are sensitive to, maybe gluten, maybe um, lactose, maybe dyes, whereas Synthroid wouldn't have gluten and it may not have some of these other things that are in levothyroxine. Um, and then there's a whole other... <laughs> variety. There's tyrosine and it's a gel and it, it doesn't have any mm. excipients, any fillers that people would be sensitive to. So if it's someone who is very sensitive to things, they would want to go more the gel route instead of gel cap route, instead of something like a solid tablet. Now, let me ask you, how uh, how accessible is that information to a patient to know that there are so many it, different it's, options it's for them? It's accessible, but it will probably cause like yeah. paralysis by analysis if you're looking at all the different blogs and you're trying <laughs> to put it all together. And then things with manufacturers yeah. change. The dose in levothyroxine, for example, isn't always consistent. 
So even though it says, let's say 88 micrograms mm -hmm. on the tablet, the actual manufacturers by because of the way that the laws are with generic brand medications, formulas, whatever you want to call them, right. it can kind of right, undulate, right. which isn't good for someone who is taking something and needs it consistent. Otherwise, you know, everything in their body is affected. It's not like there's that. So there is like a, a seven day window where it's like, let's say you forget to take your med your hormone replacement, you'll be fine. You might feel a little bit off, but you'll yeah. be fine for a few days. Whereas, um, okay. If you're on that medication and you have like a 30 day dose of it, you won't be fine after 30 days of that batch having the inappropriate amount. So that's sorry. That was kind of a tangent, but I feel like that's important for people to know because sure. all of the doctors will push the generic brand for starters. They always think that the, the right. patient, the client wants the least expensive, most affordable option. And two, insurance only mm -hmm. wants to reimburse, which is a whole other story because obviously we pay a fortune for insurance. And um, right. that's also the reason why a lot of times doctors won't do a full thyroid panel when someone wants it especially if you're in an HMO situation, they don't want to do that. They won't. Yeah. So, and that's exactly, so that was my experience just recently. Um, when I was at my doctor's, I was like, you know what? And honestly, after watching some of your stuff and listening to other podcasts and blogs, I'm like, there's just gotta be more going on because between like you're saying with brain fog and mental clarity and um just like struggling with energy and a bunch of different things I was like I just want to know and I asked my doctor if we could check my thyroid again do a, a thyroid panel and she was so hesitant and then I got her to finally just do the most basic one and I'm still left with so many questions so and I'm sure a lot of people are so basically like my question to you is what is it like working with someone like yourself who kind of goes beyond that information and um, beyond that mm -hmm. basic blood panel mm -hmm. to really educate Well, working with more. me, I mean, as a root cause practitioner, we always look beyond the like face value of a lab. I look for patterns. So where your doctor mm -hmm. may have ordered, what's it's a TSH, is that screening tool for the thyroid, thyroid simulating mm -hmm. hormone. And they could say, I want to order the TSH reflex to T4. Reflex means if that TSH is out of lab normal range, which depends on which lab we're talking about, could be mm -hmm. pretty wide, then only then will we actually test the other marker T4, which isn't even a full thyroid panel in itself, those two tests. Um, because oh, wow. if without T3, which is the active hormone, we have to convert from T4 to T3 to actually use that in the cells. Um, then what information do we have? Especially if we know that the full normal lab range is not optimal. Lab ranges were made with sick people, not people that were 100% healthy. Mm -hmm. So you have this, you know, some labs still use up to 10 as the TSH range, where most people and a lot of the thyroid um, organizations, the medical organizations have in like, there are three different ones, and they don't always agree. But they've come down to like 4.5 mm -hmm. to be the top of the range for what is healthy. Whereas we know in in other studies okay. and in the literature, that optimal for conceiving in a healthy individual is less than 2.5. And that most people who are on thyroid hormone replacement and have a condition actually feel best under two. And I personally feel best around one and most people do. But would you pick that up if you just ordered a TSH and did a re even if you did the reflex? Right? How would you even know you wouldn't? Yeah, and most doctors would you're say, Oh, you're in the yeah. normal range. Especially if they're not an endocrinologist, and I won't even say right. that all endocrinologists yeah. would agree that it should be lower or care if it's mm -hmm. like there are people too, they just don't care all the time. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Uh, as frustrating as that is, I mean, I know that there's probably so much work to be done, uh, but you know, what is it that your clients kind of 
get to have exposure to? Is it is it knowledge? Is it it's extra lab that. work? Why I dig it, deep. Uh, so that I so all of when you okay. see any kind of integrative or functional medicine practitioner, you're probably going to get like a ten page onboarding like a uh, questionnaire so like when you go to the doctor they ask for your insurance information okay. and, like <laughs> all of the yeah. right yeah that's all they care What's your about insurance, right? your insurance and insurance do you have any family history yeah. of x uh -huh. y and z and it's like 10 things that are typical yeah so i yeah. want to know like how wh how were you born by c-section or by a vaginal birth like did you have antibiotics from a young age? How often do you have antibiotics? What's your exposure to this, that, and the other? How often do you eat fish? Do you travel? Like, where have you traveled? And it, then I, I, it's so much more than that. Of course, it's so long. But, yeah. and includes family history. But I want to know, like, what made you you? Like, where can we map when mm -hmm. things started to go wrong? And what happened around that time? That could be a trigger for what's going on. So was there an event where you went through puberty, pregnancy, pregnancy loss, menopause, that may have been a trigger for any of this because major hormonal times, fluctuations for women are times when autoimmune diseases kick in a lot of the time. Um, the other things would oh, be like high use of antibiotics or um, some kind of gut infection. Maybe you traveled somewhere and you got a parasite or you got really bad food illness, um, foodborne illness. And so you're kind of living with this upset GI tract and what's going on there. That's another trigger for autoimmune disease. So I'm looking at this and how's your stress and what's your lifestyle and what's your diet like? And is it balanced? And are you getting enough of all of these different things that we know need to be consumed for optimal health. And it's not just like optimal health, you eat these things, but thyroid, you eat these things. It's the same thing. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because it's almost like you would assume that it would be something different because it's more marketable. Yeah. Right? It's more marketable to say this is the thyroid There are diet. certain oh cases, no. you know, there well, are things. That's why we need to get individualized. That's why you can't just say, like, this is the best diet. Yeah. Of course, I will say, like, almost blanket statement, I can tell you what the best diet is. Um, but I would need to get real nitty gritty because if someone's been trying that for a while and there's still something wrong, I'm going to say, all right, let's try right. removing this, this, and this. These are some heavy hitters that can cause problems. We also need to check your gut. Let's also look at a comprehensive uh, micronutrient panel. And there are a handful of other tests I might consider, depending on what else may be going on. Comprehensive hormone panels, um, looking at their stress hormones, and obviously dealing with their lifestyle. I mean, you can't take any kind of magic pill to get eight hours of sleep per night. And quality sleep, like, right. do you snore? Are you, or do you sleep, have great really? sleep hygiene? Are right. you going to bed after sitting in front of a TV for hours or tablet or whatever it may be with blue light or using blue light blocking glasses? Right. Are you, you know, is it optimal for you? There are so many huh. things. And then really personalize it with the right, whether it's supplements or meditations or exercise that maybe needs to be, changed or reduced or increased the nutrition like you're not eating enough so right oh my goodness well i want to ask you something too because you've been mentioning a word or a phrase that i feel like is uh coming out a lot recently which is functional medicine and root medicine can you explain to us what that is and i it's more than just a buzzword yes, right now yes right? what so is <laughs> When you go see most conventional, also called allopathic doctors, you will get a pill for your ill, right? You'll get a Band-Aid. Not always. Sometimes there are people out there that mm. truly want to be a detective and figure out what's going on. Um, but the, the reality is they don't have the time for it. They're not reimbursed for more time. Um, our whole healthcare system and insurance-based healthcare system is it's broken. We all know that. So when you see an integrative or functional medicine practitioner, it's typically the same thing. Integrative means that um, we're integrating different kinds of medicine. So it could be someone who's trained in, like, let's say, Ayurveda or Chinese medicine 
or something else like that. And then also some form of medicine or like holistic nutrition um, and then functional looking for the root cause of problems. So in this case, using functional lab testing to see what is going on with your biochemistry, what is going on with your genetics, what are your predispositions and your weakest links, Where, what makes you different from the person next to you when you eat the same meal and you react differently, why? So we use testing to get to the root of that why, and we just keep peeling back these layers of the onions to find why, 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 until we pinpoint an experiment for that person to actually heal the underlying problem. And so that layer by layer, you can be healed from the inside out. This is going to be just my complete, you know, be, me being naive why is this not the way that everything works? Why is it, why is, is it just that it's not accessible? Is it because insurance isn't covering this kind of stuff? Uh, why is this not the way that everyone should be treated? It's expensive for starters. So there are mm -hmm. definitely okay. known problems within our community about accessibility and the quality in terms of the mm -hmm. um, access to this kind of medicine. But because of its expense and because it does take people that are open to thinking differently um, outside of the normal conventional medicine paradigm, it's just not widely accepted yet. So it will be, I mean, there's a mm -hmm. movement and people in the world are pushing for yeah. it, but there's only so much you can do yeah. when insurance, like I can't accept insurance for what I do. I can accept insurance if I right. treat people that are already sick. Diabetes, okay, kidney disease, um, obesity, mm -hmm. some like that's new that that's even covered. But like overweight, no. Pre diabetes, no. And we know that those two are highly correlated with hypothyroidism, insulin right. resistance. It could be an you can see an early sign of insulin resistance before you even get to a pre diabetes situation, and we're not allowed to be reimbursed through insurance for anything like that. And the amount of people that are probably deterred from getting this kind of treatment because of that, where, oh my gosh, yeah, it's, it's not fair. Cycle. And I, I truly like, it hurts when I know that there's someone who I could help, but I have to keep a roof over my head too. Like, what can I do? So it's, right. it's painful for everyone and it's upsetting for everyone. Well, I appreciate that you're taking time to answer some questions that I have, but also I asked a lot of questions over the weekend from my audience and oh my goodness, it, cool. you know, my, my inbox lit up. So with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions. I have them uh, queued up over here. I love this question. Uh, are there any correlations between mental yes. health and thyroid health? Yes, so many. I mean, for all the reasons we could talk about the actual chemical reactions, um, because you're not able to produce enough serotonin, you're not converting, all the cells are affected, you have brain fog, um, your gut is often implicated in thyroid conditions, um, which affects everything because then you're not breaking down food, you're not absorbing it. Also, 80% of the serotonin is actually found in your gut, created by your gut. So... Yes, if that's not healthy, then oh. yeah, you're absolutely going to be facing problems. And then there's the stigma that comes along with all of the symptoms of the disease, which, you know, can be overweight, mm -hmm. can be obesity, can be diabetes, can be um, anxiety and depression. So you're feeling all of that. Lots of relationships are affected by this condition. Ugh, yeah. Definitely a mental trip mm -hmm. with or even like, yeah, you everything. could feel like you're not a good, whatever you want to say, employee, parent, partner, you know, it, it, everyone has their own demons and it just brings out the worst. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Ashley's question is, what are signs we should get tested and how in depth of a test of a test should we be so, asking for? So signs? This can be confusing and it depends on the time in your life, but the common signs are mm -hmm. fatigue, 
dry skin and hair, puffiness around the eyes. Um, if you see in your labs that things are off, lab signs could be the obvious TSH being high if it's high. Um, pre anything like that, or if there are no thyroid labs drawn, um, having high triglycerides, having high cholesterol, having higher blood sugars, either your fasting blood sugars, your hemoglobin A1C, or your insulin, your fasting insulin. Those are all signs um, that something is wrong, and it could be your thyroid. Um, iron labs could be off as well. And I could go further, but that it gets more into like the realm. Those are the very like <laughs> conventional labs that, that if you get your annual, you might be lucky enough to have all of them looked at. Um, and signs, uh, fatigue, you know, exercise could be a problem. You could be winded easily. You could not have the energy to do much, being mm -hmm. cold all the time. And there are some people that at certain times, instead of gaining weight, they actually lose weight. That was actually my situation postpartum. I lost so much okay. weight. Um, and I lost my milk supply mm -hmm. when I was trying to breastfeed. And that's also something that can happen. But I was underweight because I had such severe thyroid destruction that my body was destroying all of the thyroid cells that were holding thyroid hormone. So when they were destroyed, all that thyroid hormone was dumped into my body and it caused me to be hyperthyroid. So I just burned through everything, couldn't get enough food, could mm -hmm. never sleep, was wired and tired. And, um, and then finally it stopped. That was a, uh, what's called, um, oh my gosh, thyroid, thyroid toxicosis. So I kind of became like toxic with thyroid mm -hmm. hormones. But then once that destruction slowed down, my TSH, instead of being under 2.5 was actually 120 because my body couldn't make anything anymore. It was like, I'm sending the message. The message is the TSH. It's this message from the pituitary gland going to the thyroid saying, hey, hey, mm -hmm. we really need you to start putting out some thyroid uh, hormones now. But thyroid's like, meh, got nothing left. So. So what kind of treatment did you do to kind of get yourself back we was it lifestyle diet change was it certain medications yeah, so what was it that you did personally? i had a long journey i did start feeling much better soon after i'd say within like six months of getting on thyroid hormone replacement um and i've had iterations of that i've had to up my dose at times i've changed from levothyroxine to synthroid which helped a lot um i was really stubborn i did not think that i needed to cut out gluten because First of all, I didn't know enough early on that like just how many people with autoimmune disease need okay. to cut out gluten. Um, but I just thought, I don't have any symptoms mm -hmm. in my gut. Like my gut felt fine. I had no symptoms that are like what people think of, like no gas, no bloating, no constipation, no diarrhea. And so mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem, clearly. Um, but when I ran testing on myself, I was like, I'm messed up. Um, so I treated everything. And then I did a, another test that I really like that can definitively tell someone if they do not tolerate gluten or wheat. And there are tests like this for other foods as well. They're called Zoomers through a lab that I really love. And it came back like, oh, yeah, you're for sure like never eating gluten again. And you know what? That day I cut out gluten and within six weeks, these crazy patches of dry skin on my ankles, knees and elbows disappeared. They were like baby soft within weeks. And I had tried everything on them. Nothing. They were almost cracking. They were like peeling off. So that mm -hmm. was that was my non-intestinal sign that I was not tolerating gluten. And then a lot of other things improved over time too. Yeah. That and did you just go to your regular doctor or how did you kind of advocate for yourself to I, get I all these extensive for myself. tests done? You just did them. Okay. You just figured out like where you uh, need to well, go for labs I and everything like that. Labs. So I do this for my clients all the time. So okay. I use uh, yeah. a, like a really great, I consider it a concierge service where I can order everything uh, for my clients and then they mm -hmm. kind of get everything packaged up nicely. They get these instructions and video tutorials on how to do it. If they need to do it at home, whether it's a pee test, a poo test, a finger prick, or if they need to go to a lab for phlebotomy having their blood drawn. Okay.
Oh, wow. Awesome. Uh, I want to get all these questions in because I think that there's, I mean, and I have my own questions that keep popping into my head too, but I'm going to ask um, this one because I feel like a question you got from one of your followers will tie in well to this. If your thyroid levels are off, does it affect yes. your fertility? Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> so if you go to a fertility specialist, if someone is experiencing issues with becoming pregnant and maybe they've had a miscarriage or two and they end up at a fertility specialist, that specialist, for some reason, they're the only specialist who will do this will run a full thyroid panel. So if that's not what happens or if that's not what someone's mm -hmm. experienced, then I would find a different doctor. Um, but yes, it's very common that if your body cannot sustain itself, it knows better than to try to sustain another life as well. So if you're not, if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, it affects your menstruation, your cycles can be off, you may not be ovulating or you may not be ovulating every cycle. And so without ovulation, you cannot become pregnant. And without ovulation, you also have dropping progesterone levels. So over time, this is what women who go through menopause can experience as well, um, especially during perimenopause mm -hmm. when things are really confusing in the body. But progesterone levels will fall because that's the progestate hormone that wants to support life after you ovulate and if an egg is fertilized. So then you can experience symptoms of estrogen, do estrogen dominance. There are all sorts of things that can happen. The hormones become just a disaster. And yes, so that is one of the problems. And then the other thing that someone asked was, do you need to, okay, so also the, the TSH, I mentioned this before, the TSH should be lower than 2.5 when trying to conceive. Ideally lower, right. in my opinion, like, two or lower. Um, yes, if someone becomes pregnant and they know that they are hypothyroid and that they are on thyroid hormone replacement, their doctor should have told them this. And hopefully mm -hmm. they had this conversation with the doctor prior to conceiving if that was a goal of theirs. But it is recommended by pretty much every endocrinologist that you double your thyroid hormone pill, your replacement, one extra day of the week. Mm -hmm. So is that right? I remember doing that. Actually, now that you, I totally forgot about that yes. until you just said that. Yeah, I remember before I, yes. before I got pregnant. I have to do the math. Now that I'm saying one, it might be yeah. two days. It's a 30% increase. I think it was, I, I want to yeah, say like it was days. Tuesdays and Thursdays. My, my sticker sheet is three years old, so it's yeah. been a while now. <laughs> but yeah, so 30% yeah. increase is what's been shown. And of course, like you want to get in with your doctor ASAP. My doctor's always said, you know, I'm the first person you tell. If you want to tell your partner first, fine. But like, I'm the first person you call and you get the blood test and you get everything tweaked immediately because those first few weeks are very important. The first 12 weeks, baby doesn't have a thyroid to support its own thyroid hormone production. So if you can't provide those hormones, baby won't develop appropriately. Wow. I mean, I, it's such a no brainer, but obviously something that you don't necessarily think about. Well, in the, a baby in those has first to develop, weeks. right? So what develops first? Why would any normal right. person who's not a doctor know that not everything develops and, and what process right. the placenta and where does it come from? Oh, wow. There's so much information to absorb that it's, it's impossible to do it in the time that we have today, but I do want to squeeze a few more questions in sure. and I hope you'll come back and answer some more questions because I'm sure there's going to be follow-up stuff and hopefully next time we can do it in person yes. and have coffee or something. Uh, let's see. Okay. There's two questions that are kind of similar. So I'm going to see how I can mash them together. Um, how to lose weight when you have hypothyroidism, having trouble even on my thyroid meds. And the other question is, is someone as someone with Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, what is the best mm -hmm. way to eat okay. to help to lose weight? So, yes. So my number one thing is cut out gluten. And yes, it is Crazy. because it's it's twofold. It's okay. inflammatory for a lot of people who have autoimmune disease. And it's inflammatory for a lot of people who don't, but I will mm -hmm. never make a blanket statement. There are absolutely people who can tolerate it for one reason or another, and especially if it's the ancient kind of gluten, the ancient grains that are less um, modified to include okay. more gluten because higher gluten products mm -hmm. 
that are made with extra gluten or grains that were bred to include extra gluten are going to be more reactive for people. Um, mm -hmm. That said, if you have an autoimmune condition, like a little bit is not the same as none. Your body reacts and it, it stays in an inflamed state and it holds on to that reaction for a long time. So if you say, oh, it's just like a bite here and then like a few days later or a week later, oh, it, it was just like me finishing my kids like dino nugget or whatever, like, no, sure. that doesn't cut it, unfortunately, for this situation. Um, so yes, so you can lose yeah. a lot of water weight if you cut out foods that you're reactive to. However, you do have to figure out what foods you're reactive to. And I do not advocate for staying off of foods or going and grabbing an Everly Well or any other kind of IgG food sensitivity test like that because it's not the answer. It can be part of the journey sometimes. I actually recommend a different kind of test that includes more than just the IgG reactions, the immunoglobulins that react to whatever foods are on the test and they look at your blood and they da da da. So there's a different one that, that looks at mm -hmm. more inflammatory markers all combined to see your total body inflammation load, like all of the things that are making up inflammation in your body, how do all of them react? Because that's a better way of gauging. Um, but healing your gut is, okay. your gut is the gateway. So you have to plug those holes yeah. in your gut. If anyone has learned about leaky gut, that's kind of the layman term for the scientific term, intestinal permeability and intestinal permeability. So like if someone's a geek and wants to look on PubMed, you can look up intestinal permeability. That is, that is the technical term and any doctor will fight you on it if you try anything else and they'll probably still fight you on that one. Yeah. Um, but if you have a leaky gut brought on by irritants or brought on by antibiotics or brought on by whatever it is, stress can even do it. And we can, I mean, I could nerd out about the stool testing that I do and what I see and how amazing it is when people just do these simple things to change. Um, but you can reduce your food sensitivities and you can reduce overall infl inflammation just by healing your gut. It does help to remove these food sens these highly sensitive foods while you're healing your gut. So it's kind of like a little dance there. Um, and then mm -hmm. eating your protein, making sure you're hitting your protein goals because a lot of people don't eat enough protein or they don't eat it in a balanced way. They might have like a no protein breakfast and they might have like a giant steak for dinner or something like that and think that's fine. Mm -hmm. And the reality okay. is that's really bad for your blood sugars. And it's hard on your gut to digest that much meat at mm -hmm. once. So a better way of doing it is animal protein. This is my preference. Not everyone will agree with this because some people are vegan and vegetarian. Share um, your secrets. It's okay. I have scientific <laughs> reasoning for my preference. <laughs> but but protein yeah. at breakfast, yeah. lunch, and dinner, and never eat a naked carb. Those are two of my biggest things. And then vegetables, as much as you can. So if you're not a big vegetable person, find a way to sneak it in till you train your palate, and then aim to get them at literally every meal. Because breakfast is not a time for sweet okay. food. It's actually a bad time for sweet food. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you're cortisol levels are higher in the morning, especially if you have kids that you're trying to shuffle off to school. <laughs> um, cortisol raises your blood sugars. Yeah. And that is a bad thing in itself. We can get into another time, but it does affect autoimmune disease. Um, so you want to reduce your sugar and your carbohydrate intake and have more of a veggie and protein rich breakfast. And Interesting. So not the fruit that we're all sold. <laughs> breakfast being the breakfast, breakfast food, food or right? Fruit anytime so is wonderful. We do need to eat all of the colors. I would just recommend pairing it with okay. a protein. So if you're going to have okay. a banana, have some almond butter or a handful of nuts or an egg or something mm -hmm. like that. Berries are lower glycemic index and higher in antioxidants. So right. they're a huge, amazing go-to. I recommend them like four times a day. If you can tolerate that, it depends on your blood sugar okay. situation. Uh, and by that, I mean like a half a cup serving. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah. then just carry that whole thought throughout your day. So your snacks should be some kind of fat, protein. Um, so like maybe like I like deli meat roll-ups. So I take a little bit of deli meat. I wrap it around some avocado. And maybe I'll have some fruit or veggies with that. Ooh. Avocado is technically a fruit, but it's also oh, like obviously that. a fat. So, <laughs> yeah. a fat too, yeah.
So you mentioned uh, a naked carb. What's a naked, naked carb? carb? A carb you, without or what's a protein a or a carb? fat with it. Yeah. So. Okay. So like just a bowl of pasta. Yeah. Or just that's a bowl like of my rice nightmare. Or something like that. Um, okay. I'm not against rice at all. Yeah. <laughs> that's like my yeah. So it's people, it's not a bad food. I don't want to say any food is right. bad. I will say gluten is not good for people with autoimmune disease. Um, but. It is not good to have just a bowl of carbs um, because it spikes your, your insulin, mm. that spikes your blood sugars, and then you're on this roller coaster, which sets off a whole cascade of other events, and it's inflammatory. It puts you at risk over time of diabetes, um, weight gain, the way that we store extra calories is brought on by insulin, so we, and then I, I could just seriously go on, but the the best and easiest yeah. thing to do is pair your okay. whatever kind of carbohydrate it is with some kind of protein and fat, whether that's like you're eating a sweet potato, but you're putting a pat of butter on it and you're having it with like a breakfast sausage, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. And I would say even if you have leftover sauteed I mean, greens, really just, like throw the greens is, right? with it. Yeah. There's just so much, um, it's like common sense balance, but I feel like when you're in the moment, it's so hard to put. It is. So the way together. that I tell people to visualize it is take your plate, cut it in half visually. Half of it should be non-starchy vegetables. So that might be a salad or um, broccoli or cauliflower, you know, the cruciferous brassica family, which are really good for so many other things that I could get into. Um, and then one quarter of it could yeah. be your protein. Maybe that's an egg or two, depending on what meal it is or however you like to eat. And then the other part could be your mm -hmm. starch. So maybe that's your sweet potato or maybe that's banana, like half of a banana or your berries or whatever you're in the mood for and drizzles your salad with some olive oil and balsamic and throw some pumpkin seeds or some like exciting nutrient dense food sure. on there. And it doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. No, I, it's it's so helpful to have visualization. I mean, I know you put a lot of really great inspo on your uh, Instagram as well. So it's there's so many resources out there. I think that people sometimes just need the encouragement to realize that, or the push, this is what I need to be looking at. You know, rather than looking at uh, <laughs> fashion hauls, which I'm guilty of. Well, we Instagram. need that. I need that from you. It's, so it's beneficial. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll trade. No problem with that at all. Uh, Liz, I want to know, you mentioned a little bit earlier uh, about fasting. And as someone who was keto for a long time, and I was doing intermittent fasting, I feel like there's, and this can go for anything, it's like information overload, where we hear from one camp that it's great for this, we hear from another that it's bad for this. In your experience with hormone health and thyroid health, how do you see fasting um, affecting? So those fasting levels? can be great for the gut, and it can be great for your blood sugars. You're um, bringing down your insulin levels if you're someone who has insulin resistance. It can also be a stressor on the body, which can like raise cortisol levels, which can actually then for increase your blood sugars. So we have to play it right. Right. Well, that's what I was wondering about when you said that earlier. I was like. Wait, this sounds right. like so and then fall. the other thing is um it can also slow down your your metabolism if you overdo it or if your body is not in a safe place if you if your body does not feel that it can handle what you're trying to force it to do it will slow your thyroid down because it's fearing that you know it it's going into survival mode so instead of people jumping into a fasting situation where maybe they're doing like an eight hour eating window. Maybe they need to have a longer eating window. Maybe they just start with fasting for 12 hours. Maybe they stop eating at 7 PM and they don't have that bedtime treat or whatever it is that they're doing. And then they wait to eat until seven the next day, start there. And then you can slowly inch it out and maybe you get to like a 16 hour and your body can tolerate it then. But you also have to be doing all the right lifestyle and diet thing. It's not just this intermittent fasting is going to change everything. No, like 
You need the sleep. You need the restorative right. exercise. You need to still eat the right things. You need to make sure that you're still eating enough in that window. Because if you're trying to lose weight and you're right. just constantly eating like 900 calories because you have those few hours and you're eating in one or two meals, mm -hmm. sorry, your body's going to freak out and you're not going to get all the nutrients that your body needs to feed the metabolism. Your metabolism is a biochemical pathway. It needs all of these cofactors, these substrates that feed into it to actually get it to work, to get the you know wheels to spin. So if you don't take in the vitamins and minerals that you need, you'll start having brain fog. You'll start having iron deficiency anemia. You'll start getting leg cramps. Like you will fatigue early when you try to exercise. It's, it's pretty simple. There are times. <laughs> you just made so much click. <laughs> you really did. No, I, I, because that's kind of exactly where I was when I hit that plateau um, where I was, just doing a 16 8 intermittent fasting and then because i wasn't eating i think my stomach did end up shrinking and i wasn't eating enough during that feeding window and so many other things just started to kind of come up and i was uncomfortable and irritable and brain fog and all this stuff was not happening and then once you know i worked with a couple nutritionists and started to understand that yeah. you need to eat you, like everyone where and I mean you know like that's I'm so done with diet culture and everything so that's why it's so fascinating to me to understand the functional medicine side of things the way that our bodies are meant to consume food and good food and things that are nutritious for us rather than yes, villainizing absolutely I'm all about eating as much as you can of the right things and enjoying life because so much yeah. of what people don't realize is that enjoying life and actually living is part of your healing and part of your health. It's not just hyper focused on one thing. Nothing can be viewed in isolation. So it's so true. Oh, and what a good way to wrap up too. <laughs> we we answered for the most part, I think we did answer everyone's question. I know they're going to come up with some more. Um, but why don't you go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you, how they could work one on one with you. Sure. So you Give can us find me goods. on Instagram at WhitneyC.the.rd. I also have a website, Whitney Crouch, RDN, registered dietitian nutritionist.com. And I work with people one on one there. You can contact me through my website or through my Instagram. And I also have a group program that I'm relaunching in about six weeks. It's a thyroid program. So it's heavily focused on Hashimoto's, but it also has tons of information if someone just has hypothyroidism or if they have Graves disease. And I do free office hours weekly in that program. So any questions that come up that are not already in the content can easily be covered. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I look forward to yeah. uh, seeing you in person soon. Yeah, sounds great. Thank again you. Very, very soon. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Talk to you soon.